a way I dealt with rejection in this industry is by. Mm, chips and salsa and margaritas? Is that? That's <laughs> the right. You could literally give. <laughs> What's up, guys? Amanda Smith here with Kate Scott, and I am so happy to see you again via Skype this time. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. This is awesome. Thanks for making this happen. So you do a little bit of everything, whether it's play-by-play, -play, hosting, anchoring, reporting, you name it, Kate does it. <laughs> How did you put yourself in positions where you were able to learn and become so versatile? Yeah, I think uh, I got really lucky. That's pretty much what it comes down to. Um, I've had a lot of people in my corner since I got started. So I actually started as a print journalist way back in high school, then started doing TV when I was in college at Cal, um, and then got into radio right as soon as I graduated. And I've loved everything. So I've wanted to keep doing it, which a lot of people do, right? But it's not it's not that easy to be able to do that. Um, but But thankfully, somehow, some way, uh, I've been able to, I started kind of as a sideline reporter, like a lot of women do, um, and then slowly but surely got to do some Saturday night anchoring here in the Bay Area to get used to a teleprompter, get used to writing scripts and stuff where my writing background really came back to help. Um, and then, gosh, has to be over 10 years ago now, um, I was kind of getting my reel around to people and they were taking a look at it. And multiple people said, have you ever thought about doing play-by-play? -play? Um, and I hadn't really, right? Because there were so few women doing play-by-play -play when I was growing up. Uh, I can count them on one hand. So I hadn't thought about it. Um, and then literally two months later, uh, I got uh, an email from one of the first people who gave me an in in the industry, Paul Aldridge, who we now work together at the Pac-12 Network. Um, and he said, hey, I'm producing this high school football package in the Bay Area this year, and I would love to have you be one of our play-by-play -play announcers. Do you have any interest. So it was just, it was crazy. And that's why I say I'm so lucky because as you know, Amanda, a lot of times it's right place, right time. And you just have to say yes and then figure it out. Um, so that was how play by play got started. And then over the years, I just was able to somehow not sleep that much and find a way <laughs> to keep working on all of the skills because, you know, like I knew that some skills were better than others and I needed to focus on one for a little while. Um, but that's one of my favorite parts to end this really long rambling first answer. That's one of my favorite parts of working at Pac-12 is that they do allow me to use all of those skills and in turn keep all of those skills sharp, which is so rare because, as you know, usually when you get hired by a, a team or a network or a company, they hire you for one thing. So the fact that I get to uh, showcase that versatility is one of the reasons I love working at the Pac-12 network. You know, I feel like how we were talking about when you're moving into those new roles, I think oftentimes you can feel a little nervous when you've never done something before. So for young broadcasters watching this, how would you describe the importance of pushing past that initial fear, initial feel, fear? Can I talk? <laughs> well, it's one and the same, right? The feeling, the fear. I get what you're saying. Feel and the fear <laughs> to take a risk and try something new. Uh, you gotta do it. You gotta do it. Um, one of my really good friends in the industry, watch out, I'm going to drop a name, uh, Kate Fagan, um, who worked for ESPN for a long time. And now she stepped away cause she's doing incredible projects that will be seen very soon. Um, but she sent me a picture just like a screenshot as I was getting ready to call, uh, the 49ers preseason games a number of years ago because I was scared out of my mind. And every day I questioned, why did I say yes to this? Like, Everybody is going to be watching or listening because it was radio, uh, just waiting for me to screw up. At least that's what I kept telling myself. And then you have to remind yourself, really, nobody cares. You're not that important. But Kate sent me a picture that uh, just was like a wall somewhere. I don't know if it was in New York, somewhere in the world, and just said, fear is a liar. Um, and I've kept that on my phone ever since. And uh, since that assignment in particular, um, which I think was the most scared I've been in my career, I've taken on a number of other things in my career since that have scared the daylights out of me. Um, but during that lead up to the 49ers games, I really was able to get familiar with the feeling and the fear, um, because it's always going to be there. Um, it comes and goes, right? Depending on the assignment, depending on how comfortable you feel, depending on your partner, all different things go into whether it's really intense or whether you can easily push it aside. Um, 
but I think these days now I just talk to it because I realize that looking back, the biggest risks I've taken in my career, the things I've been most afraid to do, whether it was because I didn't trust myself, whether it was because I was afraid of blowback or a combination of all those things, those have been the best things for me because they've pushed me, as you mentioned, to do things that I didn't think I was capable of doing. Uh, they've proven to me that I can do things um, that you know maybe I didn't think a woman was gonna do or wh whatever the case may be. Um, so that's a roundabout way of saying if you're really scared of something, that's probably a reason to do it because <laughs> it's going to push you um, to another level that maybe you weren't going to get otherwise or would have taken you much longer to get to because you were trying to pace yourself, which is something I struggle with. I always try to be, I don't know if it's a woman thing or if it's just a personal thing. I always stress like being so prepared and over prepared and I'm trying to get to the point now of just trusting myself and just going with it. Because again, I, I've done big things, I've taken risks, so keep taking those risks, especially if they're scary, because a lot of times fear's a liar. It's just trying to scare you out of the way, get somebody else to do uh, something that you should probably be doing. So yeah, now I'm just like, what's up, fear? Hey, I recognize you. <laughs> yeah, I ain't scared of you. What's up, come on, come on. I know that you're gonna be along for this ride, but I know last time you were that I, w things worked out pretty well, so yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna go print off that quote and hang it in my room or something <laughs> it's, it's a good reminder i see you there but i know you're just a lion pizza anyway yeah <laughs> <laughs> if you wanna you know i got a little sensor beef we can that's true that's true Post -prediction. <laughs> <laughs> so i want to play just a quick little fill in the blank game with you okay so before i was where i am now a job i had was blank Ooh. uh I was an airborne traffic reporter. That, uh, that was actually one of the numerous first broadcasting jobs I had uh, coming out of college where I thought to myself, how am I ever going to become the person in the sports world that I want to be? But thankfully, again, my mentor said, just get your foot in the door. You're going to get on a radio station in the Bay Area. Somebody's going to hear you. So I was uh, flying in one of those little Cessna airplanes. Thankfully, I was not the pilot. I was just a traffic <laughs> reporter. But <laughs> 4 a.m. wake up call, driving to the airport and in Hayward here in the Bay Area. It was, it was a wild time. <laughs> Something I would go back and tell my younger self would be. Mm, something I would tell my younger self. Uh, probably the quote that is now one of my favorite ones, other than the fear one that I just dropped on you a few, a few minutes ago, um, little by little one walks far. Um, it's a Peruvian proverb that I first heard actually, it was on the wall of my high school English teacher's classroom. Um, uh, but last year when I hiked Machu Picchu in Peru, uh, I found it there again and it was just crazy to me, like life coming full circle from high school to now in my mid thirties. Um, just because when I was younger, I remember in college thinking, okay, I have to get to ESPN by the time I'm 22 and I have to do this by the time I'm 25. And it's like light all those dreams on fire because that didn't happen in my journey. But I'm so happy with the way that it has gone and where I am now. And, and I'm so excited about what's coming and what I don't even know is in the future. So that's what I would tell my younger self that I still have to tell myself now, like, slow the F down, Kate. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> You've done a lot. You're having a great time. You get to hang out with incredible people and call sports for a living. Um, so it's okay to slow down. It's okay if you're 35 and not working for ESPN yet. If, if it's supposed to happen, it's going to happen. Just keep working hard. Yeah. There's no timetable for our goals and dreams, right? Yeah. We just got to keep on keeping on. Especially in broadcasting, man. No ladder. Just like no. a tree with a bunch of branches and confusing vines and <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> that was motivating, wasn't it? If you're thinking about getting into the industry, good luck. <laughs> good luck. Jump on the tree, climb a few branches. You'll probably keep, fall, but keep on going. Yep, you'll slide down, just keep going. So we had some awesome fan questions for you, so I want to get to as many as we can before we're at the time. So Brandon C. Smith 5 would like to know, with all of your accomplishments, is there one that feels most satisfying? Mm, I saw this actually on Twitter and even having the time to think about it, Brandon, first of all, thanks for caring and thanks for the question. Gosh, that is a really difficult question um, because I try so hard to focus on every single broadcast as if it's my most important broadcast, which probably doesn't make much sense unless you're maybe in the industry because a lot of people would say, oh, it had to be the 49ers. Oh, it had to be calling a football game on the Pac-12 network. But for me, the most satisfying 
is usually just the last broadcast I've done because I put so much time and effort into each one because as I try to tell young up-and-comers, you never know when the home run you call on game one of a three-game series against a team that's blowing out another team, that could be the only home run of his or her career. And with social media these days, right, they're going to want to post it everywhere they can. So you better get their name right, and you better put as much energy and effort into that call as if you were calling a World Series. Um so I have called and gotten to cover some really cool things, right? I was just at the Final Four in Tampa with Sabrina and Maite and the Oregon Ducks. Oh that was awesome. <laughs> New Orleans 2020, let's do this. Um, and, you know, I've gotten to call, uh, not call, but I've gotten to cover Super Bowls and Radio Row with KNBR during my radio days. So I have gotten to cover some incredibly awesome events. But as far as most satisfying, yeah, usually just my last one because I try to remind myself, like, you're getting to – call sports and get paid for it. How cool is that? So thanks for the question, Brandon. All righty. Jason Ross Jr. says, do you have any advice on how to get your work noticed by network executives? Mm, that is a really good question as well. Um, and again, it kind of gets back to the tree comment earlier. We all take our, our own path. Um, I waited to get an agent for a pretty long time. I just got one uh, four years ago, right as I was getting in at the Pac-12, but I actually made the Pac-12 connection on my own just because I thought it was really important, you know, Amanda, um, that contacts in this industry are everything. Like, I don't think I have ever actually applied for a job that I've gotten. Somebody has told somebody who's gotten word to me, who, you know, I've emailed to whoever was in charge. So I really wanted to avoid having an agent for as long as possible. But then... Once I got to the Pac-12, um, I hired someone because I didn't want to have to deal with negotiations anymore because I did that a few times at KNVR. That was a learning experience, but also very useful, um, kind of like building my contact base. So this is a roundabout way of saying, Jason, um, the way that I have now gotten noticed, I've worked for NBC the past couple of years and hoping to get in with a few other networks in the next few years is through an agent because, um, and this is just for me. Uh, there are so many people, once you get to the network level that want to work for the networks, right? Like who doesn't want to call postseason on ESPN or who doesn't want to call postseason basketball on CBS or whatever it is that you want to call. Um, and so they don't usually just take like cold calls and emails from random people at that point, to my knowledge. So that's, that was why I wanted to hire an agent. Um, and that's why I waited so long because I wanted to start getting at the network level. Obviously the PAC 12 is helping me with that because, uh, network executives watch the other networks to see if there's somebody who fits their brand. And that's a big part of it. I found out too. Um, I've talked to a lot of people at the, at the networks that I've mentioned who love my work, think it's fantastic, but I may not be a good fit for their brand. So again, kind of the rejection thing, don't worry. Uh, just because you may not be a fit for one network doesn't mean you're not a fit for another, but yeah, keep working as hard as you can and get to a point. I think where you may think about hiring an agent, but I also know plenty of people who hate agents and never go through them and just kind of go through their contact base. So that's another way that you can go as well. If you're uh, really good at schmoozing, really good at staying connected to other broadcasters and producers and directors, stay connected to everyone. Um, and then, yeah, see if they can get you in contact with a talent director at one of those networks. You know, when you, you feel that rejection of people saying, maybe you don't fit this brand, mm -hmm. how have you found confidence in yourself to not change your personality or look to change ways of how you are? And you're like, this is me. This is what I bring to the table. Maybe it's not here. Let me go this way. Yeah. It's a constant struggle, Amanda. <laughs> it is. Um, right. I'm sure you've heard it a million times. People just saying, Oh, just be yourself. They're going to love you. <laughs> um, and I still struggle with that. Um, in different roles more so like anchoring is still not the most natural thing to me. I was just in studio yesterday at the PAC 12 and I'm always like fixing my hair beforehand and trying to figure out how to sit because I've just, I haven't done it, I guess, for as many years as I've done some of the other um, roles, reporting, play-by-play and, -play and stuff. So I, I still <laughs> am trying to be the anchor that I think is me being myself, which obviously is overthinking it. Um, but yeah, as far as the rejection is concerned, it was really hard early in my career because I took that as a, they're just saying that, but they don't think I'm good enough. It took me getting a little bit older 
to actually have people point out, no, this is what we mean when we say you don't fit our brand. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I love working at the Pac-12 is because it's the first place that I really feel like we're kind of one and the same because uh, some of the words that they tell you uh, right after you're hired are just like enthusiasm and excitement and passion and love. And and you see it on, on the broadcast that I do. I get to be excited. It, you're really just a fan because the majority of our audience is fellow student athletes or parents or coaches or intense fans of the Pac-12. So they want that passion that just comes so naturally to me. Whereas on other networks, I may have to be slightly more professional um, and then find that version of me mm -hmm. that is just slightly more of what they want, but still be myself. So that's why I say it's kind of a constant struggle. But again, what that whole little by little one walks far, the older I get, the more comfortable and confident I get in being just slightly different versions of myself, depending on what's required. I just love a good quote, and you're giving me all of these that I have to go print <laughs> and like hang up all around my apartment. Thank you. Well, walking motivational magnet. That's what my friends <laughs> call me sometimes when they're annoyed with me. Okay, so next question. Solly Lowe says, most exciting game you've covered to date? Ooh, most exciting game. Hmm. Well, just because it's popping into my mind right now, uh, I guess that must be the most exciting. Recently, uh, got to call the Battles of the Bay in women's basketball this past year. Uh, and it's not because it was my alma mater. Uh, <laughs> but Cal and Stanford playing here in the Bay. And Stanford was top 10 in the country at the time. And Cal was struggling. They hadn't beaten the top 25 in a while. And uh, my girl, who was my favorite player on the Cal team this year, Asia Thomas, senior out of East Oakland, like hometown through and through. Um, she hadn't hit a shot. She hadn't hit a field goal all game. And then Christina Nigue, who was Cal's big superstar, fouls out. And nine seconds to play. And Asia goes like left hand, lays it in at the buzzer. Cal wins. And it was it was just pandemonium at Haas Pavilion in Berkeley. So that was really cool because it was my first buzzer beater in basketball. Um, looking back on the call, I wish I would have called it differently. But again, learning experiences. We learn from every game that we call. And, you know, it was my first time calling a buzzer beater in basketball. So I've had a chance to listen back now and say, OK, I liked what I did here. I didn't like what I did here. Um, so that was one of the most exciting ones. And then probably also last year, uh, I got to call the UCLA Oregon softball series up at the Jane in Eugene. And they were a couple of the top teams. They were expected to go for the Pac-12 title. And it was like the first season of the series or, or first series of the season. And uh, Oregon won on a walk-off shot, and that was awesome. So anytime you get to call something that's big because of a rivalry or because both teams are really good or something like that. Um, so those are, those are the two that come to mind at the moment. Hoping for more soon. Ty Gillespie would like to know, what advice do you have for college students on getting that first job post-grad? Mm. Send your reels and resumes out to everyone. <laughs> um, and be willing, if if you're willing, be willing to to move wherever, and have a wild uh, experience for you know, one, two, three, five years. Um, airborne traffic reporting, possibly. <laughs> um, I think just don't limit your options. That's the big thing. I talk to so many kids who are just coming out of college who say, well, I w really want to work nine to five in Northern California in sports. And I'm like, okay, well, I would too. I'm 35. <laughs> I still don't work nine to five because uh, sports are never nine to five, first right. of all, in unless you're on, you know, uh, the non-broadcast side, then you could be. I know plenty of people who obviously work for teams and, you know, are in marketing or whatever. Um, but I think the more open you can be, uh, the better. Uh, I know a lot of first jobs, if you're in minor league baseball or something like that, you have to do a lot more than just broadcasting. Uh, be willing to do all of those things. And there's going to be days when it really sucks. <laughs> um, you know, I was a traffic reporter uh, and producer. I wasn't even on air for a couple of years. Um, and I was working overnights and I was working weekends and I couldn't go to friends' weddings. And I was for a long time questioning what was I doing with my life and how was this going to get me to where I wanted to go. But going back to some of the things we already said, I met people uh, who 
then got in my corner because they liked how hard I worked and how I was willing to do anything. Um, and then once they started to find out what I really wanted to do, they started to tell their friends, hey, we've got this girl. She's been working her ass off for two years on 5 a.m. traffic shift. She really wants to try sports reporting. Um, so it helps to kind of, as, as I've started to label it, build your army when you're young. And you do that by working. I've worked for literally every team in the Bay Area, you know, women's soccer teams that have folded San Jose Giants, San Jose Earthquakes, San Francisco Giants, 49ers. So now all these people know me um, and are able to, again, keep their ear to the ground, looking back on how hard I worked for them at the time that we worked together. Um, and then people really kind of get in your corner and want to help you succeed. So that was a as all of my answers have seemed to have been really roundabout way, uh, just send your resume out to everything. Um, you know, obviously try to focus on the sport or station that you kind of want to be in. Like if you want to do baseball, send it out to all the baseball teams, start there. And if that doesn't work, then maybe transition to sending your stuff out to somebody else. Um, but, uh, as you know, Amanda, everything in this sports world is connected and the older you get, the smaller it gets. And, uh, people that you start with at your first jobs, it's fun to watch them move up and they'll move all over the country and that'll expand your contact base as well. Um, so yeah, good luck, get whatever crazy job. And then, you know, in 15 years, you'll get to come on here with Amanda and say, yeah, man, I remember when I was working for the Mud Hens in the middle of nowhere <laughs> and I was doing the PA announcing and the play by play and I was doing concessions and, and it'll be a fun memory to look back on. Hey, and maybe by that point, I'll have like a studio or something. Yes. This nice white wall behind me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that's we all have the goals. <laughs> I'm going to do that. Exactly. Little by little. <laughs> Final question is from Tay Lehman. And she says, what got you into sports broadcasting? Mm, well, and you thought my previous answers have been long. Um <laughs> The answer is I loved sports growing up. When I was in kindergarten, my mom still loves to tell this story, and I could get my cereal for myself in the morning. I would go into the kitchen, get my cereal, come out, sit at our little coffee table in the living room, and she'd come out and find me watching Sports Center. So just always been obsessed with sports. Played four varsity sports in high school, was going to play soccer in college, but wrecked my knee. Um, so started writing for my high school newspaper my senior year. And thankfully, uh, I was going to go to uh, college and be a teacher, which I think is one of the most undervalued professions in the world, but that's a whole nother story. But my mom was a teacher, a bunch of my friends are teachers. So I wanted to be a teacher and kind of, you know, pass on the knowledge to the youth. And uh, a counselor who knew me really well said, Mr. Schmozzle, shout out to Mr. Schmozzle, said, Kate, um, you've played every sport. You know everything about sports. You watch ESPN nonstop all day, every day. You're on the microphone because I was doing lots of PA announcing and emceeing in high school. Uh, you do the morning announcements for sports. You are a PA announcer at soccer. And well, why don't you go to college and look into sports broadcasting? And it literally was not till that moment <laughs> that I even, even considered it because there were so few women doing it at the time. Um, you know, Robin Roberts and Linda Cohn were our female sports center anchors. Um, and Bonnie Bernstein is one of my mentors and Hannah Storm and Andrea Kramer and Leslie Visser, but like that was, there was less than 10. Right. So I just didn't even consider it a profession. Um, so thankfully for Mr. Schmazel, love you Schmaz, uh, mm -hmm. I went to Cal and majored in communications and that's how I started to get into sports broadcasting. So I was very lucky to have all this passion, have someone smack me in the face and say, hey, you idiot, you have all this passion. <laughs> You're not in college yet. Why don't you go try to do this? And that's another thing. Like there's plenty of people who get into this industry after they've started in something else. So don't ever think that you have to do this right out of college, just the same way that there's plenty of people who I started with and five years in, they said, I, I can't do this. The, I, the grind, the lack of money, um, you know, it's just not going to work. I want to have a family and I have these other dreams and they've left the industry. And then I've had people who've come into the industry. Um, you know, they were in another form of communications, whether it was um, marketing or um, communications for like health companies and stuff. And they said, hey, I found out I'm really good on camera and I want to do this. Or I really love doing the behind the scenes stuff and producing things. But sports are my passion. So I want to learn to produce sports. So there's never a wrong time or a right time. And there's never the same path for any two people. Um, but yeah, that's how I got into sports broadcasting. Got some good advice, 
went to Cal, did a ton of internships when I was in school. I did four internships in college. That um, is a lot. <laughs> yeah, every summer between, you know, the years I would go back to Fresno, where I'm from, um, and intern for the ABC station there because it was smaller. And like, I was the only intern for the entire newsroom. So I got to do everything. So that's another, that's my last bit of advice. I know a lot of people always want to intern for the big companies, ESPN and stuff, but sometimes it's easier and you get more experience uh, in your hometown markets or in smaller markets. And, you know, by my junior year, between junior and senior year at Cal, I was literally like one of their reporters but unpaid they would just send me out with a cameraman and say Kate go to the courthouse this day and do this okay you have to go to this baseball game the next day and you have to come back and write the script and we'll edit it but it was amazing experience and now all those reporters because it was a small market they're all in San Francisco and LA and I've stayed in contact with them so again everyone who starts down here with you is going to rise up with you too so yeah that's kind of how I got into sports broadcasting <laughs> check my LinkedIn it has more information <laughs> There's the plug. There's yeah. the plug. Real quick, what did you do to your knees? Uh, so I was the one girl who didn't do my ACL. Um, I did my meniscus in my right knee. But it was way back in it was way back in the '90s when uh, everyone was doing their ACL, and very few, at least girls that I knew, had done their meniscus at the time. Um, and I don't know if it just wasn't the best surgery or if I came back too soon. But um, I came back and played one more season. But anytime I would run, my knee swells up a lot and kind of just turns into a stiff little balloon on the right side of my body. So uh, things kind of worked out because my passion for soccer which was, again, going to be the sport I wanted to play in college, kind of gone, because as a lot of people who play sports know, you're, you're working your tail off to get recruited, and then you finally get there, and you're so tired of it because it's turned into a job. So uh, that allowed me to transition to broadcasting, and, and things, things have worked out okay. <laughs> your story is just so crazy to me, because I don't know if you know why I got into sports broadcasting. No, tell me, tell me. But I tore my ACL three times, oh and then I had two meniscus surgeries. So kind of similar to you in high school, I was on our newspaper staff, and yeah. everyone's like, you you used to be shy, but I was like so terrified of speaking in front of people. And I took a speech class, and my teacher, shout out Miss Ingram, yeah. was like, you should, you should do this, you know, like combine sports and speaking. And I was like, I don't. I kind of thought I would go be a teacher too. So like I'm just like Kate, my girl. See? Like yeah. You're so everything together. everything always works out how it's supposed to kind of in life. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, I think so. And I think sports, um, especially for women, uh, really help us kind of push through all those challenges and battles, right? Like I was just and then I'll go and let you actually get back to your life. Uh, I was just, you know, way too much <laughs> just working uh, an event for, for Adidas and Twitter and this company called Intersports for their new She Breaks Barriers campaign, which is about bringing more visibility um, to high school female athletes because we're seeing more and more, right, like high school football and high school men's basketball. We're getting to know those athletes younger and younger. So Adidas really wants us to get to know female athletes younger and younger as well so that we can start to cheer for them, right, and maybe create more of a connection with them and Anyway, when I was researching for that, uh, over 90% of female executives played a sport at some level, didn't, didn't necessarily play in college or anything. And then when you get even higher, C-suite executives, which I had to look up what that meant. That means like if you have a senior title, if you're a CEO or a COO or a CFO, like the really, really top of the level, 96% of those women played a sport just because of the teamwork and the resiliency and the challenges and all that. So... Keep playing sports, kids. I'll leave you with that. <laughs> I love it. And you are a total boss. Thank you so much for taking time to chat with me today. And hopefully sure. I will get to see you in person again soon. Yeah, looking forward to that. And who knows, maybe one of these days we'll get to work together. That would be fun, right? I would literally die. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. I can't have totally, a death. I would pass out. No, I would no. All of a sudden, they're like, I mean, go to Amanda. Are you there? I'm like, <laughs> Where'd Amanda go? Okay, well, let's get back. To I got it. I got it. And that's a good partner. <laughs> no, but thanks so much for having me on. This was awesome. And obviously, I have a lot of uh, hopefully somewhat meaningful advice to pass along. So thanks for letting me do that today. Okay, guys. For Kate Scott, I'm Amanda Smith. We'll see you next time.